Welcome. I'm Dr. Brian Williams, president of McCall College and a bioethicist that is pleased to introduce this lecture series in helping healthcare become healthier and more caring. Today we'll be on lecture 2B. For those watching in sequence, I trust you enjoy our conversation together today and the opportunity to advance a form of better health care. Today I'd like to introduce to you the principles of, of health care that are foundational to the field of bioethics. And I'd like to introduce to you a textbook that has served as the seminal or primary text in the field of uh, bioethics. And that particular, that particular te uh, text is entitled Principles of Healthcare and Bioethics by Tom Beecham and James Childress. And the first edition of the Principles text came out in 1979 and uh, at latest review of the uh, text itself, it, the, the, the most recent edition looks to be the 8th edition in 2019. The text introduces us to four principles. And in chapter 4, it talks about autonomy. In chapter 5, non-maleficence. Chapter 6 is on beneficence. And chapter 7 is justice. These four principles, called the mantra of healthcare education, are essential uh, to understanding bioethics as it is currently constructed. We need to now ask the question, how do we define these principles? The first principle that is primary to the thinking of uh, Beecham and Childress is that of autonomy. And the definition we'll use comes from their work. It means to govern oneself, and also it's indicative of freedom and liberty. Our second principle is beneficence, and that we saw in our introduction to Hippocrates, to do good. We also saw the third principle, non-maleficence, to do no harm. And so both of those are foundational to the Hippocratic understanding of medicine. The fourth principle is justice, which we'll use the, de the, the, the definition giving to, to, each one, uh, to each one's right or due. And a simplified definition of justice is fairness. Let's ask, the, let's ask the question, how do we assess these principles and begin some sort of an assessment? How has healthcare done uh, in living up to its principles? If we take autonomy, governing oneself, we've seen wonderful successes. Privacy, a key issue in modern healthcare, has been a success story of autonomy. Patient control uh, in, in, in their healthcare process when that has been possible. And so those successes are uh, an, uh, an indication that autonomy has uh, been successful in entering into healthcare in important ways. As far as its failures, the pandemic illustrated a primary failure of autonomy. And that was patient control in hospital. We all, we all watched as patients had little to no control during the pandemic. And autonomy was uh, set aside for management of healthcare during the pandemic. So we can consider that a distinct failure. When we look at uh, the second principle of beneficence, which is to do good, and the third principle, to do no harm, the successes are quality people in healthcare 
are trying their best. And so I, I think the vast number of people uh, within healthcare are quality people. I think the vast number of people uh, attempt to do good uh, and at least do no harm. And so I think we can consider that a success of modern healthcare, that they have selected people that have been living out the Hippocratic Oath to do, to do good or to do no harm. One of the dilemmas uh, 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 of beneficence and non-maleficence, and it's clear failure, is good results are at a high cost. I'm, I'm thoughtful of a Confucian principle that a, uh, a, a good deed that is too expensive is no good deed. A, a good deed that is too expensive is not a good deed. And so the attempts by healthcare to provide quality care that come with a price tag that far too, people can, too, too few people can, can afford is therefore not a good deed. And so I, I lay that at the feet of healthcare and saying all of your quality now is of no value because it's too expensive to most people in America. As we begin to assess justice, and we'll use that simplified definition of fairness, it's clear successes have been the expansion of, of quality health care into a far larger slice of the population, and that goes by the simplistic term Obamacare. Uh, and so we've seen that to be a success where far more people have access. Unfortunately, during recent years, we've seen that erode. Uh, as the price of, of health care becomes too expensive uh, for, for, for government to manage uh, or to provide quality providers in the delivery of health care. The other success that we've, we've seen uh, is in a recent success with the cost of insulin. And uh, Lilly was the, uh, the Lilly company was a, was, is an illustration of sensing the market and responding to the market and lowered the cost of insulin to a, a level that's more achievable for more people. Unfortunately, having spent 10 years in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm wondering if that isn't simply a tactic where they can erode their competitors and later on rebuild the price of insulin. And so I think there's, there's a, a future story that needs to be told on uh, the attempts by Lilly to lower the cost of medicine. And so right now they need to be applauded, but we also need to keep a wary eye on companies uh, that seem to be uh, acting as they are expected to act in their own best interest. And we'll have to see where those interests uh, uh, work out into the future. And so a clear failure for justice is the excessive costs limit access to too many and uh, for those of us that have had quality health care for most of our life we're seeing that the av available plans that we have have access to are too expensive uh, for uh, anyone within the average range of salary uh, and the opportunities uh, for quality health care are slipping away uh, particularly for the working poor uh, while there, many of them are getting health care plans, they can't afford the deductibles, they can't afford the premiums, uh, and, and so the lifetime, uh, the annual costs uh, are, are too high for them. Uh, and so we see that within our working families, and we're also seeing now that the middle class is being exposed to, to far greater costs than they can stand especially in an, in an inflationary. But let's take a little more time and focus on autonomy. A little bit of background. Autonomy has been a key principle from the 1700s. Uh, when Immanuel Kant, a key German philosopher, offered his call to reason, Kant encouraged free will as the central part of the rational self. 
And that call for, uh, for uh, free will was easily translated as freedom or liberty in the latter parts of the 1700s. See that in the writing of the Constitution in America. 200 years later, uh, bioethics emerged in the 1970s with a central theme of autonomy or free will of the patient and also patient rights. And so, and so what problem was autonomy solving that it, that it was needed in the 1970s? For a German philosopher, freedom of the individual was necessary in a society of strict social duty. Veneration of the fatherland uh, created a tight social net around people. During the 1700s, war and death were routine. For Kant, healthy free will needs the tension of duty for social good. Autonomy to live at its best challenged duty to die at its worst. And so that's a Williamsism. Autonomy to live at its best challenged duty to die at its worst. For America in the 1700s, life and liberty challenged the power of the greatest empire, Great Britain. Autonomy of one person challenged the community at large. And what we see is the independence that was so crucial to the desires of the liberty seekers in the late 1700s was positioned against the community at large, which was the British Empire. And so that was a primary task of the War of Independence, was to give freedom to the individual. For healthcare in the 1970s, the physician was the moral authority uh, of the healing arts. We define this in, an, in a negative sense as patriarchy. Autonomy challenged patriarchy. Autonomy was presented as a simple truth, one-sided. And so the negative of patriarchy received the positive of autonomy. And so I, I introduce that to you as a struggle, uh, so that autonomy was not balanced with anything else. And so that created a high demand for independence that was received by all patients as a wonderful improvement and, and the erosion of authority that began earlier than in the 1970s was extended in healthcare by the erosion of the physician to define healthcare. I have a little com a little uh, a little ditty that uh, has turned into a Williamsism. Content without context is pretext. The content was a was autonomy. The context was healthcare. But if you simply introduce healthcare uh, autonomy into healthcare with no context around it, it's pretext. It doesn't even have a, a, a way to be successful uh, in, in the long term because it doesn't have a context that encompasses it. When autonomy, freedom, or liberty is, is stripped of its context, it becomes pretext. Pretext is not coherent text. It's just word. I will argue that autonomy must be paired with its symmetrical pair, and I've, I, I've offered the term interdependent. Freedom must be paired with its symmetrical pair, and I offer that Kant showed us that that was duty. We must retain, retrain our society that 
with, with the addition that autonomy or freedom need its symmetrical pair. For autonomy, that's interdependence. For freedom, that's duty. We clearly saw in the pandemic that there was a struggle with autonomy. We saw it not only in healthcare, but we also saw it with the introduction of vaccines in 2020. We also saw that one's autonomy trumped your public health. One's free will versus the collective beliefs of science, the community, and most physicians. And while most people got their vaccines, those that didn't get their vaccine used their trump card, autonomy, depend, uh, uh, freedom, uh, so that they didn't have to receive it. Unbridled autonomy that energized America saw its failure defined by hobbling our healthcare system. During the pandemic, bioethicists marked this problem with a call for thinking of others in one's community. That's an illustration of an ancient concept, one and many. They're interlinked. There is only one when it's compared against the many. The many. There is only many when it's composed of one. And so that one becomes many when ones co uh, coalesce or collect. And many become one as a community or as a society. So these two terms are interconnected. Was there an earlier conversation of one and many? Oh, yes. A primary symmetrical concept in history is one and many. One is both the individual units of many and the whole together as one. Many is defined as multiple ones. This ancient concept explored by P Plato in uh, Parmenides gives us a method of moral assessment. The Williams method of moral assessment. One and many is the foundation of the individual and community. Let's translate one. One is the autonomy of the individual. Many is the interdependence on the many. One is freedom of the individual. Many is the duty of someone else to protect my oneness. Duty requires courage. And we'd like to begin with one of the ancients in understanding courage, Aristotle. For Aristotle, constructing a good individual and a good community is the key to a good society. And Aristotle, who was alive in 384 uh, before Common Era and lived to 322 before Common Era, during his education, he was Plato's student. And I think the three great philosophers, the, uh, the triumvirate of great philosophy, you can certainly define as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And so Aristotle was Plato's student and became his successor. He offers a path to constructing a good society with courage of the individual as is starting. Courage is developed uh, from Aristotle's thinking between acting cowardly, a vice, and acting rashly, another vice. Cowardice is focusing on the one, yourself. Rashness is focusing on the many, other, others. The virtue is the mean between these two vices. The virtue is courage. Let's use an illustration to try and understand it. 
And so uh, we'll, we'll begin with the soldier as it was Aristotle's, but let's also translate that into our nursing community. And so cowardice is, is seen as a pleasure, uh, a, a definition of pleasure. A person who is cowardly does not want to run into the battle. They run away from the battle and they seek to please themselves. Rashness is seen to be a terribly painful act as one acts in battle by exposing oneself to the enemy to try and, and, and protect those around them. And that creates an enormous amount. Of and so instead of these being two vices, why don't we understand them as two virtues? Because protecting yourself is a virtue. There are times when you must protect yourself. I would also like to say that protecting others is also a virtue. That these, that, that, that willingly uh, giving of yourself to protect others is virtuous. And what if we recognized that protecting oneself and protecting others are two virtues in symmetrical opposition? And so when one, one, one attempts, uh, when one comes out of our training, and let's continue with the soldier, you are trained to protect others. You have to move away from protecting yourself and your training says protect others. And in the first battle that a soldier will, will encounter with all of their training, their likelihood is that they'll, they, they will naturally protect others. But in the midst of battle, if they survive their first battle, they'll recognize that they may have been acting rashly. Uh, and their attempts to, to, to protect others really put them into difficult and dangerous situations, but they survive. And so the next time they're in a battle, uh, the likelihood is they won't act so quickly. They'll protect themselves a little more than they did in the first battle. So the second battle, they may be more reticent to move into the battle. The third battle, they'll recognize their reticence and move back into a sense of protecting others. And in their fourth, fifth, and sixth battle, they're going to operate in such a way that when, when necessary, they'll protect others. When necessary, they will protect themselves. This Aristotle defined as excellence in the mean. And so they're operating between these two barriers, not unlike a roadway where we operate our cars between two barriers to, to arrive safely in a situation and we will operate well yes we could jump in our car and go straight across cross, cross country to from where we are to somewhere else and we would possibly arrive uh, if we had an awful lot uh, of, of equipment that would help us to portage rivers uh, and to climb mountains but we typically go through the windy highway to our destination between barriers that guide us. And so those barriers, uh, in between the barriers, life lives in excellence in the mean. Let's translate that to a nurse. So a nurse who is, op who is coming right out of, out of their training is trained to care for others and, and willingly gives of themselves and cares for those patients that come within their purview. But they recognize after a while, and they quickly recognize during the pandemic, that they were giving more of themselves than they had to give. And so they began to pull back and to protect themselves from all of the strain that caring for others brings. And so they too learn to negotiate between caring for others and caring for themselves. But it had to be a symmetrical uh, interpersonal relationship 
where they're where, where they are interdependent uh, at times and they are uh, willingly caring for those and they are self-dependent at times and they had to negotiate into that but aristotle taught us that that our life isn't just built in a perfect symmet symmetry of the mean that we have to lean into the pain we have to lean in for a, for a soldier they have to lean into protecting their buddies into protecting their society and that's what aristotle defined to be leaning into the pain if they leaned into pleasure then they would be self-serving but it takes leaning into the pain. And Aristotle learned this from watching athletes who were gifted and high-level athletes. They had to lean into the pain to be a successful athlete. And so they had to move through the pain of getting their muscles conditioned so they could be a superior athlete. The nurse has to lean into the pain of caring for others. Uh, and so that's the lean of the edifice that the virtue of courage creates. And I will argue it's a symmetrical uh, edifice where you have the, the, the virtue of caring for others as well as the virtue of caring for oneself. And yes, those can be carried in, in, into vices, as, as Aristotle argued. But I think for, for the vast majority of people, we have to look at the, that these are virtuous acts, and to recognize that caring for oneself is a virtuous act. But we must lean into the pain uh, in, in our persistent professional life of protecting others. And so courage and healthcare are interwoven. There must be courage. There must be the lean into helping others and caring for others. There must be the lean into the pain that that requires for the for uh, the healthcare institution to survive, but there also must be a re recognition that that caring for oneself is also a virtuous activity. We must have the courage to lean into rashness. That has been an essential issue of the pandemic. Staff had to de had to face a deadly virus and serve that serve their community often this was at extreme personal risk and we see that the efforts that that staff in healthcare went to protect their families from the virus sadly healthcare corporations have monetized this courage and yielded a maximized revenue stream when staff are at their most courageous this has damaged the individual both the patient and the staff. This virtue became a vice when in the hands of leadership that does not have the best of one or all in mind, but only the best uh, of serving their shareholders or the individuals if it's a profit-based profit organization. And so we must worry about these organizations that have taken the necessary requirement for courage in healthcare, monetized it, maximized the revenue from that, and have turned it against society, so that now our healthcare is detrimental to the vast majority of our, uh, our community. And so we have to solve the institutional asymmetry that we introduced at the beginning of our conversation. And so the Williams method of moral asymmetry, a moral assessment, might be a tool that healthcare and hospitals can use to solve this particular problem. And so as a result of uh, the, the, the pandemic, we saw that there was a tremendous problem with burnt out healthcare providers. And so if we assess the, future, the, the virtue that has become a vice, we see that courageous staff have been helping the community, the many. But it becomes a vice when their own per personal health 
uh, is damaged as a result of their acting out the virtue of helping others. So we have to invert the one and the many. And so now we've been serving the one. We must assess and invert to allow us to care for the one. We have to allow the staff member, the one, the courage to take care of oneself. And so then, as, as part of this method develops, we assess the inversion, invest in the one, until ready to return to caring for others. And then we have to discover that this is really an oscillation. This is a discovery of a healthy oscillation between one and many. We certainly, we certainly uh, hire and staff our hospitals with willing people that care for others. But there must be an oscillation between caring for others and caring for oneself. And it has to be healthy. We have to find the guardrails where we lean into, we act wisely when expect, expecting service to many and also recognizing service to itself. But both of these are virtues. They aren't vices that we need to stay away from. We need to expect the caring of others, and we need to expect leaning into the pain of caring for others. But we must have effective oscillation to caring for the one. And our health care system will only become healthy when we have effective oscillation between caring for the virtue of, of others and caring for the virtue of the one, the staff care. So I'd like to introduce you now to our second case study. It's entitled Burnout. You are the director of nursing at a small rural hospital in Idaho. You are short-staffed and preparing a memo to act nurses to take extra shifts to cover the schedule. Then an email hits your inbox. One of your nurses had made a terrible mistake last night. During the second of a double-double, 12 two-hour shifts uh, that were sequential, they followed each other. This particular nurse grabbed the wrong medication. About nine hours into his shift, an agitated elderly patient needed a sedative. Reaching for Versed, he grabbed Vercoronium, a paralyzing drug. He clearly failed to read the label. The scanner to check IDs was misplaced at that time, and an alarm rang across the hall following delivery of the meds. The patient died. You are a newly minted administrator with a young family. The police have, are asking for an interview. On reviewing the nurse's employment file, you remember you forgot to request the transcript of the nurse's degree during hiring. You were so exhausted that at that time you had six sick kids. When it arrived after hiring, you saw that the nurse had an LPN certification instead of the RN that was verbally affirmed in the, universe, in, in, in the interviews. You were so short-staffed, you buried that mistake. At the end of the detective's interview, no mention of education was asked. Do you admit your mistake? Your annual review is later in the afternoon. Do you admit your mistake? Let's go out to our, uh, our flow sheet uh, as, far as, as far as working through our various case studies. What is your instinctive response? What will you say to the police officer? What will you say to your supervisor later that afternoon? What shapes your decision? Always use your instinct and recognize your instinct. You are the accumulation of your experiences and you always have an instinct, instinctive response. And you need to journalize that response. Also understand where the forces are that are shaping your response. For many of us, it's protection of our families uh, and protection of our employment. 
so that we can maintain our, our, our healthy family. But what shapes that decision? Uh, might it be a, something that the police officer says? Might it be something that the employer says? But when you have a time to journalize, it's also important that you, you begin to think through the consequences of your instinct. Our instinct can take us to the wrong place. We all know that. We, we must have instincts, but our instincts can be wrong. Uh, and so it's, it's wise for us to get out ahead of our instincts with consequences. What are two consequences that you need to consider that result from your instinct? And it's nice to write at least two down. If you can think of others. That helps you shape your decision. It's also very important that you gather any facts that are available to you. It's important that we do research, uh, understanding the drugs that uh, might be a, a first step to the research, uh, and making sure you understand that. Uh, and so uh, that might be the, the, the basis that you begin from. And anything else, uh, what's the, uh, the LPN certifications? What are they, should they do? What's an RN and how are they different? To make sure that you have the facts uh, of the different uh, layers of consequences uh, from your earlier mistake. Okay. Then you want to ask, who are the primary characters or institutions? We call those stakeholders in bioethics. Who are the primary characters? And so obviously you're one. Obviously the patient is another. Uh, obviously uh, your, the police officer is a primary. Obviously your employers are primary. But is there anyone else that you should be thinking of? Anyone else whose consideration that you need to, to be sensitive to? Uh, uh, pe people that, uh, that are a little further out in our, cir our circle of influence. Be begin to think of those. Uh, and, uh, and so th those are important. I'd like for you to offer a key ethical issue that relates to burnout. Frame one key issue that you think is the most important as a competing claim between parties. Should the first party do something or should the second party do something? I've introduced to you the, the Williams uh, uh, method of moral assessment. And you begin now to have one way of framing it. The one and the many. Who's the one? Who's the many? And how do those interact? Uh, is the many the, the police officers and the justice system? Is uh, the one you? Is the one the patient uh, and the other the, uh, the nurse? Uh, is the one the hospital administrator uh, representing the many, and you or the nurse being the one? What's the key issue here? There's a lot of issues going on on any uh, difficult bioethical uh, case. And so try and frame where do you begin? Where, where, where is that place of beginning that you want to begin to assess? I'd like for you now in this second case to begin thinking about, about the specific tensions uh, and the principles or rights that are in tension. We've already talked about some principles. We've talked about autonomy. We've talked about uh, doing good, doing no harm, justice. Let's make sure you practice those so that you begin to think, what's the autonomy in this situation? Uh, uh, what's the, wh who's trying to do good? Who, who's trying to keep away from harm? Uh, what's, what's justice got to do? And so I'd like for you to think about them and begin to think about them in tension. Uh, we've seen that beneficence and non-maleficence are are, 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 seem to be in tension all the time. We've seen that uh, justice for one, justice for many, uh, seems to be in some sort of tension. We've seen and, and I've tried to understand autonomy in the hospital uh, and to recognize that uh, the autonomy of the individual uh, is, uh, is set against the autonomy of staff and the autonomy of, and, and, and the organizational dynamic. Apply the Williams method of moral assessment. Assess the virtue, invert one and many, assess the inversion, and oscillate wisely. 
So try and go through each of those steps, trying to define things, trying to recognize uh, the virtues that are occurring here, to invert the virtues, to assess what you've done, and then to begin oscillating. And then always, what's your plan of action? You have to do something, and it's going to be happening quickly. So you might need one to get, get ahead and discuss your plan of action. Let's talk about what we've, uh, we've accomplished to this point. We've reviewed an early example, the God Committee, on communal participation in healthcare. We've applied case study analysis, and we've seen our first case study and how it operates, and now we're beginning our second case. We've assessed how a static principle, autonomy, seemingly all alone, failed in crisis. We've introduced one and many, a foundation of symmetry. We've re reviewed Aristotle's extremes to the mean, and we've introduced Williams's method of moral assessment with a focus on burnout. I trust you found that our work is pointing us towards a healthier healthcare system and a caring healthcare system. I trust you're sensing that we are on a positive direction to make healthcare better. And we're using bioethics as a foundational tool to assist on that topic of how do we make healthcare healthier. Thank you for joining with me today. This has been our Lecture 2B, and we're pleased to, to introduce ideas that will help to make healthcare healthier and more caring. Thank you for joining with me.